In recent years, there's been a fair bit of learning and teaching of mathematics and artificial intelligence, machine learning, to the extent that you've published books at an incredible rate. When you're talking about NLP, you're talking about linguistics. If you're talking about linguistics and machines, it's compute, it's computer linguistics, okay? So we're going back to theory. Explainable AI, the best explainable AI is model agnostic. Dennis, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. Where in the world are you calling in from? Okay, thank you. So and thank you for inviting me. Yeah. And uh, right now I'm like 150 kilometers from Paris. I'm out in the country, in the Champagne region. Oh. Where you have Champagne, you have uh, Burgundy and all that. I'm, I'm around that place. Wow, that does not sound unpleasant. Is it's that very, a, very pleasant. It sounds amazing. Is yeah. that kind of a like a COVID thing, or you're out there all the time? No, 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 no. I like I like Paris. I like yeah. to be out of Paris. Yeah. It's like being in Manhattan, and then you go out a bit to the north uh, west into you know just have to go 20 miles, and you're not you're in the woods, you're in the forest in, in New York State, so around Goshen or places like that. <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, yeah, I hope to someday spend time outdoors. It's like this thing. So as we discussed before the episode started, uh, I'm Canadian. And so people often have this idea of you being outdoorsy, but I grew up in downtown Toronto and now I live in downtown Manhattan and I haven't experienced much outdoors at all, but I've heard it's wonderful. And someday I'll experience that too. <laughs> Toronto is a nice place too, you know. Toronto is nice. It doesn't have a Champagne or Burgundy region around it. We got the Niagara region, which is our best imitation. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why I chose France, in fact, because I could live anywhere. But I found that the quality of life, like you have med medieval culture that you can't find in North America, medieval culture, universities that go back to the 13th century. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I like that part. And then you go to modern Paris and then out. I, I, I like that. But I like you know to travel. So it's not really a problem. Well, and you've so you I've noticed from videos that I've seen of yours in the past you have very interesting art, uh, you know, in the backgrounds. I think you studied history at points in your career. Um, yeah, you, well, I, yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm pretty, yeah, I paint, I play the piano. Well, well uh, my, I was born in Berlin, in fact, and I, my father was a military lawyer for NATO, so I traveled all around all the time. But my dream was to go to Sorbonne University. That, that was my thing. Because in those days, the, the president of the university says, well, if you came here, it's because you're really interested in the history, the geography, archaeology, mathematics, linguistics. So you can major in something. But in this university, you can go to any class and you can, you can get credits for any. So I would go into this cross-disciplinary education, which was very fascinating. That's why I spent so many times. I went to three uh, Sorbonne universities. In fact, I just can I just couldn't stop learning in there. So wow. uh, yeah, yeah. So I studied a lot of a lot of everything. That sounds amazing. That's like my dream retirement. I wonder if they'll accept me then. And I wanted to start my life <laughs> like that because I was thinking like that because at one point I was working a lot in the states for like uh, student money, college money. And I was driving cars, you know, this drive away thing where they give you a car and then you can take it anywhere. So I crossed around the state. And one day I was sitting in Florida and I say, do I want to live here? What do I want to do? No, I really want to go to Sorbonne University because I could have <laughs> stayed down in Palm Beach, you know, and had a nice life yeah. study there. But no, I, no, I wanted to come back to Paris and live this educational thing. And there's so many cultures right next to Germany, Spain, Italy, Portugal, uh, UK, uh, Belgium. Uh, I mean, it's incredible. I'm forgetting countries. I, I don't want to leave <laughs> the, uh, viewers out like uh, Netherlands, uh, Luxembourg, <laughs> Denmark. I mean, you just sit there and you have all these people there. You're, you're living in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's rich in culture. I am jealous. It sounds like you're in the right spot to be. No, Manhattan is great. Yeah, there's, it's a very concentrated piece of culture. <laughs> and then you, you don't have to, and then as you say, you go 20 miles out and you're just in the woods. Um, <laughs> That's right. 
People don't realize that, but you're only like 30 minutes from a uh, beautiful nature, just right northwest. Uh, just go through Washington Bridge out there, and that's it. Yeah. Um, so amongst all of the learning that you've been doing, in recent years, there's been a fair bit of learning and teaching of mathematics and artificial intelligence, machine learning, to the extent that you've published books at an incredible rate. So uh, this year you published Transformers for Natural Language Processing. Last year you published two books, Hands-On Explainable AI with Python, and just a few months before that, AI by Example. So I'd like to dig into each of these books. I've got a copy of Explainable AI right here, but I want to kind of go backwards chronologically. Um, so let's start with Transformers for NLP. Uh, what is this book about? I know, so I can give a little bit of color maybe for the audience, but you could do a much better job. So natural language processing is the application of data science or machine learning to uh, make use of natural language in some way, like written language or spoken language. And uh, yes, to maybe automate things. And transformers are particularly interesting in recent years uh, because they've been shown to have unprecedented accuracy at a lot of natural language tasks. So, yeah, well, let's take this back a second. So we're going back, we're, when you're talking about NLP, you're talking about linguistics. If you're talking about linguistics and machines, it's, compu it's computer linguistics, okay? So we're going back to theory. And there's one little thing we have to understand is that we're getting inputs with data. You get a lot of data. So that's, that's the input. You have all this raw data, billions and billions of pieces of data. And the, on the other side, you have to do some kind of representation of reality so it doesn't look like murky results, right? So up to now, you had all that input, and then you had to get good representations, but there were several models. Like you would do uh, k-means clustering, then you do parsers, then you do recurrent neural networks, and then you can do uh, CNNs and all. So it was a bit like, you know, a lot of tools to do all kinds. Of, so every time you had to do a task, you had to find another uh, another tool like uh, an SVM. So for like 35 years, because I started very early in artificial intelligence, okay, so I saw no changes. And I say, where, where is this going? I mean, these people are just writing a lot of algorithms. And I wrote one algorithm like 25 years ago that's running all over the world while we're speaking. So I say, why do they write all these algorithms when you can get one universal algorithm to do the job? Of course, I wrote it for supply chain management and not, not NLP. So then all of a sudden, Google around 2017 has this problem. We have 5, million people, 5 billion searches per day. We're having problem with the U.S. Senate because they keep asking us questions like, I'm speaking like big tech, like Mark Zuckerberg is called to the Senate. And the person, this is the reason Transformers exist. He's called to the Senate and they say, you know, there's that post. And he's thinking, what post? There are 2 billion posts a day. Yeah, but that post uh, there about, he's thinking, well, what are they talking about? I'm surf. I'm a multi-billionaire. I'm surfing all the time. And they're asking me about the 1 billion, 500 million. What, what, I don't even know what's in that post. You know, I'm, I'm trying to do my best here, you know. So, and he says, I don't have the tools. So he's thinking, go see my team. And the team says, well, we can't, we just can't, we, we have like, a hundred uh, algorithms in there. We're not making it. It's not, we're not making progress. Twitter has the same problem. Amazon, uh, Microsoft. So at one point Google says, we have to stop all that. We need something industrial. So instead of having like a convolutional neural network where you have layers, but none of these layers are the same size. None of these layers do the same thing. That's like a, a 1930 car. No, what we want is a V8. You know, a V8 engine looks beautiful inside, like eight, eight engines here, right? Mm -hmm. V8. So they come up and say, let's forget about this recurrent neural network stuff. We want a V8. So let's start with eight heads, which are like a V8 engine. Let's start with eight heads. 
forget about recurrent stuff and all these layers. And we want to write a layer and we're going to put the layers and every layer is the same size. Let's make every layer the same size. That way we have an industrial model. It's like a rectangle and we just stack these same layers, same size. And they come up and say, well, that's not enough. We're not going to go fast enough that way. Let's take one of these layers and split it into a V8. Wow. And now we're going to run those eight layers, those eight parts of a layer on eight heads, on eight GPUs, on eight processors at the same time. Wow. They're going to run there. And they're just going to, all these words are just going to analyze other words. We just want to say, uh, Dennis and John. John has a guitar behind him. Does he play the guitar? Just let's put all that together and see where that word fits into context. And let's and once that layer is over, let's not let's not mix it all up. Just add it and send it to the next layer that'll do the same thing, building on what it learned in the first layer, but it's always the same size. So at one point they reach this model and no one knew what it was going to do because it was training on raw data. And it, it wasn't really labeled data. They use labeled data just to show people. It did excellent results. And then all of a sudden, OpenAI comes along and says, you know what? That's a good idea. Why don't I create a stack not with 16 layers, but 96 layers? Instead right. of using 5 billion params, why don't I do it 175 billion parameters? And why don't I ask Microsoft for a supercomputer, a $10 million supercomputer with 10,000 GPUs and tens of thousands of CPUs, and now you have a factory. So now you have this industrial model V8, and it's just there, and it's going fast, fast, fast. And then all of a sudden, they wake up and they say, uh-oh, what does it do? How, can, how is it possible to do all these tasks? And in fact, they discovered, because it's called emergence. Emergence is when you don't know what's going to happen, but it just emerges out of all that training that, in fact, the system, a GPT-3 transformer or a BERT transformer, they just learn the language. And once they learn the language, it's based on what you ask them, the prompt. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you type nice prompts, it will analyze it as a sequence, and it will try to find out what follows. So in the end, you end up with the GPT-3 model trained on a supercomputer, and you can ask it anything you want. Give me the synonyms of headphones and stuff. You can invent your own tasks, or give me a grammatical breakdown of the sentence, or recently, why don't you just take my what I'm writing and, and translate it into Python instead of translating it into French or right. translating it to JavaScript? Right. And then just to finish the little story, you bounce back to Google and says, why don't we create a trillion, a trillion parameter model? And that thing's going to be so big that, you know, it's going to exceed human capacity. And they're say, and people are saying, gee, well, how are you going to, where are you going to get the computer? I mean, it's, with the other one, that was $10 million. And it's one of the top 10. Google says, yeah, but why are we bothering ourselves with all those floating points? We don't need all that, those floating points. So let's build our own TPUs and just cut all that floating point stuff out of there so we have a domain specific machine. And now they're creating, they've created supercomputers that we can rent for just a few hundred dollars an hour, which is not much for a corporation. That's even power, more powerful than mm -hmm. one that OpenAI has. And then you can train what you want. And then the, the beautiful thing is it bounced back into Google that has BERT. And Google search now is based on BERT. Right. Everything's BERT in Google search. So you see how we went in like a few years, we went from prehistoric artificial intelligence to super industrial, uh, in, an industrialized society. And big tech did that miracle. I mean, you can say anything you want about them, but what people don't understand, it's like people like you and me that are working on it. These are small teams of maybe 10 people. They're in their corner. They're trying to find something. They're not the billionaires. They're the guys like us, you know, just trying to do stuff. And they come up with incredible things. So we, we do have to admire big tech uh, in that respect. You can say anything you want, but no one's going to do as, uh, you know, what they've just done. It's industrial. So that's Transformers. Yeah. 
You may already have heard of Data Science Go, which is the conference run in California by Super Data Science. And you may also have heard of Data Science Go Virtual, the online conference we run several times per year. In order to help the Super Data Science community stay connected throughout the year, from wherever you happen to be on this wacky giant rock called planet Earth, we've now started running these virtual events every single month. You can find them at datasciencego.com slash connect. They're absolutely free. You can sign up at any time. And then once a month, we run an event where you will get to hear from a speaker, engage in a panel discussion, or an industry expert Q&A session. And critically, there are also speed networking sessions where you can meet like-minded data scientists from around the globe. This is a great way to stay up to date with industry trends, hear the latest from amazing speakers, meet peers, exchange details, and stay in touch with the community. So once again, these events run monthly. You can sign up at datasciencego.com slash connect. I'd love to connect with you there. So these transformers like OpenAI's GPT-3 that you mentioned, like BERT that you mentioned, what kinds of applications we've got, Google search that you talked about, um, how else, you know, what kinds of applications do you teach? You can in the do world? like, like and do question, there's, one of my favorites is summarization mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for second grade students. So you're going to say, Dennis, this guy, I'm in an interview with this guy that's supposed to be super intelligent and he's interested <laughs> in second grade summarizing. Um, maybe I will re-edit this and cut that part out. Because... <laughs> no, no, I know that that's hugely valuable. So my um, second yeah. grade summarizing thing, and I can give you like, I'll give you many others in just a list, it's one of the most interesting ones. Because in fact, when we're talking here, we look smart. Uh, you're talking I spend you do. on artificial intelligence. Whoa, do I look smart. Ask me about plants. Ask me about the names of flowers. Ask me why these insects live with these flowers and that forest and they don't live in another. I, yeah. I'm not a second grader, I'm a baby. Right. So what I yeah. like to do now is I'll take an article that's new for me and where I'm a baby, not even a second grader. I'm not even a first grader. I'm nothing. Mm -hmm. And I'll feed it to GPT-3 and I get this nice explanation where I understand everything. I say, wow, I just really like that feature. So it got me thinking, why don't wow. I go to the question answer thing? So then from there, I'm going to go ask the questions, but I... It's prompt engineering. You can see what I'm getting at. It's the way you ask it. If you ask it to explain like a college student, you'll get something you won't understand in the field, but like a second grader. Then you go, you can, you're inventing the usage, in fact. So you can go, now I go to question answers and I say, well, can you explain like, uh, you know, uh, dark holes to me like you would to a, uh, an, a, a, a child? And then he does it. Ah, now I understand. Can you explain like you would explain to a high school student? Now I can understand better. Can you explain the same black hole like a college student? Wow, great. Could you explain some math with it? Okay. Could you give me some equations? Okay. Now can you explain quantum computing? Right. Can you give me the Heisenberg equation? Okay. Can you break it down for me? Um, could you write some code now for me where it's an HTML page? I see the equation. I just want a little graph to show the waves. Wow. Just, yeah. So now I have my HTML page. Can you, how am I going to deploy it? Okay. He'll, he'll explain. Oh, I have a problem. I'd like to put your, your, your open AI in a, a Jupyter notebook, but what's the code? Can you give me the code? I, can I just copy and paste it? Okay, great. Okay. Now, so these kinds of examples, you're doing this on a daily basis. You're constantly yes, querying yes, GPT-3. Yes, I, so, I, I'm, I'm doing it right here. <laughs> right now. Actually, every, I'm, I'm, every I'm year. Doing, I'm doing it like I'm in front of the TV. And I, it's like people playing like video games. Like I'm here all the time playing around with that stuff. It's like it, it's insane. It's, a, it, you do, it's like I don't know where you're going. It's an adventure. Yeah, if you're, if you're not watching the video version of this, Dennis is pointing at his phone and tapping away at it. Um, so, so, but not everyone has access to GPT-3, right? Don't you need to be approved? You have to get, 
uh, you know, I had to, I feel I had to wait months. I had to submit an application to get access to the API uh, and then finally got it. So it seems like not everyone today could just access GPT-3 unless you have a workaround. And that's the trick. Ah. Let's go back to linguistics, okay? You go back to linguistics. What are we talking about? We're talking about we have a lot of raw input. We have a model. And it's the way we ask things that we get things. And, we, and, and what's interesting is to play around, like I just said, right? That's the interesting part. But if you go back to my book, you can get GPT-2. And you can uh... take GPT-2 and you can train it. Because what I did... For example, in chapter three, I took a BERT model and I took the works of Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, mm -hmm. and I fed all those books into it just to have fun. Then I began to ask him, you know, Kant some questions. Where does human logic go? How does human thought? Right. The goal here is to play around with it. I mean, if you, you're not, you have to have a lot of fun. Otherwise, you'll never understand transformers and you've got to get to talk to them, to explain. Now, what did I just say before? Google BERT drives Google search. So mm -hmm. what I did, like if you look at, uh, what I did is I, I take prompts like the second grader stuff and I just copy it into Google search and I'm deviating the use of Google search by giving it long sentences, not just keywords. Could you explain mm. to me uh, the solar system through the eyes of a second grade uh, student? Uh, please don't show me any videos. I just want some text. Uh, skip all that stuff. And I just wow. give this thing. But it's a, yeah, it's a transformer. So it can absorb wow. all that. That's what's new. So in fact, you can train having fun with transformers with Google search, you can ask it questions. Um, right. Could you tell me this? Could you tell me that? And then you go on. As it gives you answers in the system, you can ask it for more difficult questions. Oh, yeah, I got that. I got the Heisenberg wow. equation. I understand in Wikipedia. But now could you tell me more? You can talk to it because what right. people don't know is it's a transformer. <laughs> right. So we're filming today on September 20th. And I had just happened to be on your YouTube channel before we started filming. And it was today, September 20th, that you published a how-to video with more detail on exactly what you just yeah. described on how to use BERT in behind Google queries to get lots of interesting information. So that's something that, um, that listeners can check out. Um, so Dennis, uh, so Transformers for NLP, that was a beautiful... Uh, and that was a beautiful introduction to what natural language processing is and the history of transformers. You had a lot of great analogies in there. I particularly liked the V8 analogies. Uh, but that was just your book this year, Transformers for NLP. Tell us a bit about hands-on XAI with Python, which came out in the summer of 2020. Um, so, you know, I can, I can do my little spiel. Explainable AI is uh, it's where we apply algorithms to very complex models, I guess, like BERT or GPT-3. And we apply algorithms to those so that we can try to understand, to get an explanation for how a particular output was reached. Is that right? Well, yeah. So let's go back to linguistics again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically what we're saying, what's an algorithm? What's, what is an algorithm? You have an input and you have an output and you have this thing in the middle called algorithm. Mm -hmm. So one problem here is there's a confusion in, in many people's mind is that explainable AI is explaining the algorithm. Mm. Okay. So th that's, that's an area you can explore, you can, but no, that's not explainable AI. Explainable AI is model agnostic. I don't even care about the algorithm. Uh. What do I care? What I, I'm Google search. I'm on Google. Let's go back to Google search. I'm on Google search and I type, Explain the Heisenberg equation. Okay, what do I get? I can see the result. I don't need explainable AI. I don't. I know that I don't like that result because I don't understand anything on that page. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I can, I'll do something called Shapley. It's the theory of games. Okay, it's like a basketball player. You have a team, and you just take one player out, and you're not you're not scoring anymore. You put that player back again, you're scoring. That's Shapley. That's that's as simple as that algorithm is. Just pull something out, 
see what happens, puts it back again, and calculates you know, the input. So I'm saying explain the Heisenberg equation, which is in fact uh, an interesting one because it shows that you can't find the position and the speed of a particle at the same time. <laughs> if you're right. looking at yes. the speed, you won't find the position. If you look at the position, you won't find I've, the speed. I've known that one since I was a kid because in Star Trek, the next generation, I that's learned, right? Because right? that's, that's why... So that's where you in order, if, yeah, exactly. In order to be able to teleport, you would have to know the two. You'd have to know this kind of information. You'd have to know the speed and the direction of all of the electrons and everything, and pass that information over to somewhere else, beam it over. And so often, I think they have issues with that, right? It, it happens all the time. It seems right, in Star Trek, right. where they're like, oh, the, Heisen C, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle undoer is broken, <laughs> and now you ended up with a nose on your ear or whatever. That's right. So when you go back to Star Trek, the Star Trek thing is you just take the input like a Google uh, search and you see you don't like it. So you say, now, could you explain like the Heisenberg uh, equation in Star Trek? So now you'll get this nice explanation that you just gave. And you say, well, maybe I can't tell that, you know, I can't write about that that way. Well, can you explain the Heisenberg equation like for second graders? So you can see that when you add things and you subtract things, you get different. So that's Shapley. That's also Lime. That's also Anchors. It's about all the algorithms that are in that book. And it's model agnostic. People keep trying to look into layers. I would encourage someone to try to look into a GPT-3 99 layer model with 170 billion parameters right. and tell me which parameter influenced the input of the record that was in position 2 billion, 100 right. million, right. it's impossible. Yeah, you can, it's meaningless. You can, do, you, can, it, you can do it with small parts. Uh, people from Facebook do that. They just plug it in to see some, to see some things. But in fact, in fact, the funny thing is uh, Yann Lequin, which, uh, which was around in France in the same days I was at the Sorbonne, and there was this yeah. big fights between people on artificial intelligence he he wrote he wrote interpretable ai and he says we're going to peek into uh we're going to peek into uh the, the a transformer to see what it means and we're going to use lime but lime is a model agnostic uh so he did so what i'm saying is it's model right, it's right, 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 right. we don't care if i go to a store and i buy a phone and that phone, and I go home, it doesn't work. I don't care what's in that phone. It doesn't work. Right, or if right. I if I uh, buy a phone and, and the ringtone is always wrong, I'm not into it. I don't care. So it's model agnostic. So you take the input, you look at the output, and then you play around with the input again to see how it influences the output. And you mm -hmm. see which word or which image. or That's, that's explainable AI in a nutshell. And, and you can nice. do... A lot of things. One of the fun things I did, which is very, very funny one, is I took the U.S. Census data. I had a lot of fun with that one. It was the U.S. Census data. And I had this uh, program that was, in fact, given by Google, uh, but they're always very careful about this now, was explaining how you can figure out why someone's going to earn more than $50,000 or less than $50,000 based on the U.S. Census data. And I was looking at the fields in the data set. It's in my book somewhere on Chapter 4 or 5. And I say, gee whiz, 80% of what's in there is forbidden in Europe. You mm -hmm. had race. Right. That is strictly banned in Europe because right. there's, there's a legal problem with explainable AI. In Europe... Mm -hmm you have to explain why your algorithm did that. And if you have race in there, you're gonna, you, you can get a, a fine up to 20% of your sales. You're talking millions and for big tech billions. So you wanna be careful. So I said, gee, how can they do that? You can only do that in the States, right? But what does race has to have to do with revenue? I mean, wow. So let me take that out. I, I just pulled that out of there and I, Reran an algorithm and I tweaked a bit and I said, "Yeah, I'm getting this. I'm getting good results, as good as theirs." Mm -hmm. Then I looked, and, and in fact, he had Jamaican as a race. I mean, that was that was, that was <laughs> <laughs> so. I just took the whole field out and say, "Get get 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 this out of here." So then I take another field. 
So we're, we're back to Shapley again, right? So I'm taking another field out and I'm saying uh, sex, f- female, male. Right. Does that really matter in 2021 in the States if you have a college degree? What's a PhD woman, female doctor going to earn less than a male doctor? I don't think so. So let me take all that out too. Forget it. Take, take all that out because that's, that's, that's discriminating it's, and it's bad. And today we don't really want that because you have transgender people that don't or people that are transgendering or or people that don't want to be considered as male or female we're in right. a new world a new era right. so it's, what am i going to do put other so we're going to have other in the statistics i just pulled that field out it's useless right so now i go to another field and i'll stop on that one i'm saying now they're saying marital status is the person married divorced i said so let's sum it up i took every field out of there and i just left two fields in there age and years of education. And I'm saying if someone has 15 years of education, starting from elementary school all the way to college, that person has a probability of earning more than a person that has no education at all. It's just, you know, drops out in 10th grade. Mm-hmm. So then I go back and say, yeah, but age is a factor because if I'm five years old, I'm not going to earn as much as when I'm 20, 25 or 30. Mm-hmm. So I just found out in the 30 25 to 45 or 30 to 50 year bracket, you're in a lot more. And then when you're older, you're, you're not, you know, your brain is not so fast. So it goes back to, to baby. <laughs> and with just these two fields, inexplainable AI, I see, look at all the noise in your data. I mean, you, you could just kick all that stuff out. So it's both explaining in a model and agnostic way. I didn't speak about a model here just data input and output, and it's trying to be ethical at the same time. You see, get all that data out of there and and get the bias out of there. You don't need it because there's nothing to talk about. Age and uh, revenue, that's it. Age and and education. Makes a lot of sense to me. Um, So in my day job, we build a lot of algorithms for predicting who's a great fit for a job, and it's the same kind of thing. I mean, things like gender or race, those cannot be in your model. Of course, uh, they're useless. Yeah. It's not even a question. Of, it's ethical and it's useless because it has nothing to do with it. The subject, you can come yeah. in and if that person has either education or the experience that can compensate for a lack of education, we're looking for competence, for abilities. We're not looking for uh, insane stuff for where they came from. I don't care. I've hired... A, Tons of people in my life, I don't even care where they came from. I don't even look at their resume. I mean, the half of the time, I don't even care. They come in, and I want to see, are we are we in sync? Are, are we smiling together? How do we feel together? Uh, and you understand my questions about the job. You understand what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. Okay, you have some college degrees. That's fine. Uh, okay, well, let's get to work and see what happens. You right. know, and, and if it... And if you like it, you'll stay. And if you don't like it, you'll go. So you can spend a few months here and we'll see what happens. That's the best way to hire people because they really love you. And then you get into this thing. You say, gee, he hired me, didn't ask me any stupid questions. I mean, I want to work hard. I want to stay there. <laughs> right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, all right. So we've talked about Transformers for NLP, the book that came out this year. We've now talked about just recently Hands-On XAI that came out last year. But so that hands-on XAI book came out in July of 2020. Just a few months before that, in February 2020, you had another book called AI by Example. So maybe just kind of quickly, what is that book all about? Well, generally, uh, a book, I write a book in between two and a half months and three months. Wow. That, that's my, that's, that's how I, I work. Now, why do I write so fast? I mean, you have the whole because you get GPT three to do it. That's right. I don't even write these. <laughs> All right, so I have fifteen you, people writing. You can just stuff. do it. You can just do it in Google with Bert. You just say that's Bert. right. Write the book. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm saying here, you go back to what I was talking about: Sorbonne University and education. I have cross disciplinary uh, education, and I my first patent. Word to vector pattern, word piece, it was 1982. 
Wow. I recorded, I, I registered another patent, 1986, for expert system chatbots. 1986, I got my first artificial intelligence uh, contract with, in aerospace, which in the company now called Airbus. And at oh. the same time, I entered luxury. So I had I have so much practical experience in in corporations. Uh, I don't I don't even I never went through the AI winter. I didn't even notice there was an AI winter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I think people, if you told me there was an AI winter, and I say, well, where where is it? Because you know it's pretty warm. It's pretty hot out here. I have not in the, yeah, there. not in Burgundy. There was no there was never. no AI winter in Burgundy. No, no. So artificial intelligence, by example, is a very Simple story. Um, Tushar Gupta from Pact noticed uh, my LinkedIn profile, and he says, "You have a lot of experience. Why don't you share it?" And I say, "Well, you know, I don't, I don't really need the money, you know. So mm -hmm. because I just sold my company, uh, because in 2016 AI became came a fashion, and everyone's talking to my company all of a sudden." I said, "Yeah." I told my wife, "Let's sell it." Right. That was Planalog? Yeah, that's right. I sold it. We sold in, in 2016. And then I followed, I trained people like for two or three years. And then in the meantime, Tushar says, why don't you share all that experience, these patents and stuff you wrote with people that it would give, you know, a nice book where people, you know, get case studies and all that. And I say, why would I write a book? I mean, uh, I don't need the money. I just sold my company. I don't want to do anything. I want to stay home and play video games. Yeah. So he said, and he's saying, yeah, but he said, know, he said, you don't write a book for the money. <laughs> no, uh, well, you don't write books for money. No. Any author will tell you that he's yeah. not, you don't, you don't earn a lot of money writing books, technical books. You yeah. earn money writing like uh, Stephen King or like, they don't, but not writing technical books. I mean, uh, I don't see how you can earn money with that. But I was thinking maybe he's right. Maybe I should share this with my family and friends because I never had time to explain my job. Mm. And then there are a lot of people on LinkedIn asking me these questions all the time. Maybe it could help them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and maybe I'll meet a lot of people that way because, you know, uh, I, I have people like from 100 countries uh on LinkedIn, and maybe I'll, I'll learn stuff from them because I like culture. I like every country. I like China. I like the United States. I like Iran. I like Israel. Mm -hmm. I like Germany. Any country. Give me any country. You always find nice people because people are always thinking governments. So they don't like the government, which means right. the whole population right. is sentenced to death. You know, no. You have a light, nice people everywhere. For so, sure. Yeah, right. So he got me into that. I wrote the book. I wrote the book in three months, so it wasn't wow. that much of a big deal. The, the The only thing is, what happens is the book is written in my mind, like right. I'm watching I'm watching TV, you know, and the book is just up there, and it, it's like a, a woman carrying a baby, and all of a sudden it's just a pain. I have to get it out of get out of my system, so I'll be writing at full speed. I mean, you just can't stop me. You know, wow. it won't stop. It's a wham, 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 wham. Sometimes I can even get a chapter done in a day. So, wow. so yeah, so I'm just writing and writing and writing. And I can't stop. I just can't stop it until I get to the last page and I say, okay, now I'm okay. So it's not, it's a compulsion. It's not something, uh, it's, and I've been thinking about these st this stuff for decades. I spend every day, I spend like at least five hours thinking. Even when I was working in my company, I was always spending two. I stopped working gen generally around 4 p.m. for operational stuff. And mm -hmm. I would think like until nine in the evening. Mm -hmm. I read books, philosophy, sociology, linguistics, uh, computer science, math. So I was constantly building up my theories. And I have a theory of artificial intelligence in my mind. So I just have to organize it for the book. I know where it's going. I'm just, I'm just waiting it for, I know the next step after transforming. I'm just waiting for things to happen. So, all right. So Dennis, um, you've given us amazing context on your books. So you had AI by example that you explained last there, which based on your experience of 35 years of consulting, that you, know, you, you are able to provide that to the audience very quickly. That's how you got these books written so quickly in just a few months, 
uh, you were able to distill your 35 years of, of consulting experience with artificial intelligence, and surely the readers uh, benefit greatly from all that experience. We also talked about hands-on XAI and Transformers for NLP. So now let's jump to some audience questions. We had tons of great ones on LinkedIn. Your audience is so engaged uh, because you do answer all of their questions online. And so today we're not going to have time to go through every single uh, question that's come up. There are so many, but I think Dennis is probably going to end up, uh, <laughs> you're gonna end up going over these. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I might even make a post uh, maybe at the end of the week where I uh, mention uh, our podcast and I take all the questions from the comments in your post and make sure that all of them are answered. Nice. Well, that sounds really great. And then just to tag all the people that ask the questions. Perfect. They will greatly appreciate that. So uh, the first question here is from Serge Massis, who is also an author of a book on explainable AI. And so he was curious what XAI methods or libraries you use most for transformer models. Okay, so let's say, let's go back to explainable AI. The best explainable AI is model agnostic, unless right, you're a developer right. and you want to see what's going on inside, but you might have problems with a 96 layer GPT-3 model and 170 <laughs> billion parameters. Right. So. You can you can do it, but I might take it. So you just need the input, the output, and it's like in uh, a soccer team to see you know if you t I take this player out, what happens? So that's explainable AI is model agnostic, like Lime is model agnostic, Shapley is model agnostic. So you just want to take the input, look at the output, and then tweak, play around with the input, and see what happens to the output until you find the trigger. And so it's model agnostic. So you can use any uh, a model agnostic explainable AI on any algorithm, and it doesn't Perfect. even need to be transformers or artificial intelligence because Shapley existed before. So uh, right. it's, it applies to anything. Like uh, think of it like think of it like uh, a recipe uh, for, for for a nice cake you like. And the person says, ah, I like your cake, but you know, I'm not a really a specialist. I can't tell you what I like in your cake. So the, the person can say, you know, I, I like you so much that week by week when I bake that cake, I'll take some ingredients out until we find which one is missing. And then at one point the guy said, yeah, it's cinnamon. It's the cinnamon I like in your cake. It's <laughs> cinnamon. So that's, that's, what, that's all it's, it's, we have the input, the output, and we just see, you know, uh, that's it, the ingredients and the result. Beautifully said, I love that analogy. Um, there's another question here that is something that we've already talked about, uh, you and me, Dennis. So, um, so I'm going to kind of give a summary answer. So there's a question here from Jean-Charles Arold, if uh, he pronounces it the French way. And it's this point about how these, these transformer models are getting so big. So trillions of parameters. Do we really need this many for human language, given that we have a limited vocabulary, maybe only a couple of thousand words uh, for most people? Um, and he makes the point that uh, bees, and he seems to suggest that they only have dozens of neurons and that's sufficient for them. So what are we missing in our models? So uh, I did a neuroscience PhD, so I'm going to quickly uh, give some summary thoughts here. And then I'm going to open up the floor to you, Dennis. But so bees don't just have dozens of neurons, unless I'm misreading something here. They definitely have at least hundreds of millions, maybe billions of neurons. A human brain has 90 billion neurons. But the key thing here is that we don't conflate neurons with parameters. So the question so it says, why do we need trillions of parameters? Well, even a, a human brain with its 90 billion neurons, the connections, which are equivalent to the parameters in a model, there's more connections than there are stars in the universe. It's an obscenely large number. Um, and so <laughs> I think that's kind of the answer is that, but yeah, so our transform models today couldn't even approximate. They, they're still not as good, although no. you might disagree. Yeah, no, they're yeah. not as good. They can't be. So if we go back to neuroscience, and because machines are not brains, so that, that's one thing you need to know too, like a calculator a Texas instrument calculator is not built like our brain. So that that is 
that's like a projection we have to take out. It's like looking at children looking at a puppet show and thinking that that's a real person. No, the machine is not a real person. It has nothing to do with the brain, in fact. But let, let's keep let, let's keep on that topic and not try to elude it. So we say there, of course, you have a lot of neurons and you can't mix them up with the, the connections and the connections are the parameters in the transformer. So trillions is nothing. But there's another problem much deeper uh, for both systems, for both machines and humans, which you know as a neuroscientist, is that when we build a representation, we don't build it in one part of the brain. Like if I want an apple, okay, apple. No, I have the language part that's going to do something. Then I have the color right. part. That, there's so many things that are lighting up in there. And it, it, it's not exactly common to every human being. It's it's about that. Because I can have an, an apple associated to someone who threw me an apple when I was six years old. And right. it hit me. So now I have another part of my brain saying an apple. No. So And then another person says an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And then you have this. Uh, dopamine part. With, with. So it's extremely complex to see what is going to fire up in a brain with a word. And it's, and it's equivalently difficult with a transformer because of the billions of opinions you have on uh, the web. So one person can say, I like gun control. The other one said, I, no, I don't want gun control. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to take a vaccine. I don't. So it, it adds up to different representations. So the model has to take all that into account mm-hmm. and then you have to feed some ethics into it. So that it's big. So trillions is nothing. In fact, it's just the connections and the, the neurons are very few neurons. In fact, uh, in models like that. And then the question about, can we find easier models? Yeah, uh, exactly. So there's a question from Dr. Chiara Baston, who's in Italy. And yeah, she asks, can we do better with simpler models? Yeah. Well, I, you can't find simpler than Shapley. The thing right. is, you probably when you're looking at poster books, people show you all these diagrams. and No, it's just add up. I'm in my kitchen, and I forgot to put enough sugar in my cake. So when it comes out, <laughs> my children are saying there's not enough sugar in there. So that's right. bias, right? They're saying there's not – I want more sugar. Or if there's too much sugar – like uh, United States tends to put a lot of sugar into uh, pastry and we have less in Europe. Right. People say that's bias. Why'd you put all that sugar in there? So it's, you have the ingredients, you have the recipe, but think of that. How many people can go to a restaurant with, I would say even in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a McDonald restaurant, because people are always making fun of burgers. But I, I, yeah, well, how is the bread made? Tell me the ingredients in the bread. No one can do that. So it's we're in a complex world. So we we're, it's it's not easy. Even if you have Shapley, which is very simple, or Lyme, it's going to take work. And and even talking about bees, that that's a problem too because we're forgetting something. Is their memory? Is uh, they have patterns they're using with their body? The bees go around in certain ways to to signal things to other bees, and they're using a kind of language that we don't. We're trying to understand. So, nature is extremely complex as well. Like you said, my thing is an ant. An ant has a few neurons. Yeah. Well, what about a a whole group of ants? Wow, right. that's a brain, and right. no one can understand it. Yeah, that's a really great point as well. So. Um, as I mentioned, we didn't have time in the episode, unfortunately, to get a response on air to every question, but it sounds like Dennis is going to make yeah, a, yeah, I'll answer a all blog question. He'll answer yeah, all sure. these questions. And Find so it's somewhere clear, at the end of the week. Nice. Well, so that'll be out before the episode airs. Right. Um, so, Dennis, obviously, people should follow you on LinkedIn. That's a great place to get in touch and ask questions. Uh, are there any other places that people should follow? Not you? just to work on LinkedIn. Perfect. Because I, I work on LinkedIn, and when I'm finished, I go see my family and friends. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. When you're in the region that you're in, it must be very nice uh, visiting. Yes. 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 Uh, we get along with our neighbors. We can go downtown and eat right in front of a medieval cathedral. And in Paris and the places uh, I live and go around, we have like uh, monuments. It's a place where there's even a castle across the way from 
where I stay. So yeah. It's beautiful. I can see you. Yeah. One social medium is enough. That's right. All right. Dennis, thank you so much for being on the program. And we'll have to have you on again sometime. Thank you so much for your Sure, time. when you want. Okay, bye-bye. What a character Dennis is. I had an absolute hoot filming this episode. Today, he filled us in on the history of Transformer architectures, particularly highlighting OpenAI's GPT-3 model and Google's BERT model. He talked about how with his Transformers for NLP book, you can learn how to fine tune the GPT-3 precursor algorithm GPT-2 to perform state-of-the-art natural language processing capabilities like question answering and text summarization. And he talked about how SHAP and LIME can be used to explain how an AI algorithm is arriving at its output, no matter whether it's a simple algorithm or a billion parameter transformer model. As always, you can get the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Dennis's LinkedIn profile, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 513. That's superdatascience.com slash 513. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. I also encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by adding me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it. To support the Super Data Science company that kindly funds the management, editing, and production of this podcast without any annoying third-party ads, you could consider creating a free login to their learning platform at superdatascience.com. You could check out the 99 days to your first data science job challenge at superdatascience.com slash challenge. Or you could consider buying a usually pretty darn cheap Udemy course published by Ligency, a super data science affiliate, such as my own Mathematical Foundations of Machine Learning course. Thanks to Ivana, Jaime, Mario, and JP on the Super Data Science team for managing and producing another terrific episode today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon.